It's the most dangerous inlet on the East Coast. At least 26 vessels have succumbed to the violent wave action and shoaling. Geographically, it's a wonder to behold. But to a boat captain, it can be a dangerous passage. This is the story of Oregon Inlet and its impact on Dare County and the surrounding Albemarle and Pamlico region. Oregon Inlet is the northernmost inlet on the coast of North Carolina. It separates Body Island to the north and Hatteras Island to the south. The inlet provides the principal waterway between the Albemarle and Pamlico region and the Atlantic Ocean. Evidence indicates there has been one or more inlets continuously in existence in the vicinity of the current Oregon Inlet since at least the 1580s about the time of the initial Roanoke voyages. This John White map of 1585 shows Port Ferdinando, which was located just north of the current inlet. The modern inlet's predecessor closed at some point between 1795 and 1808, and until 1846, the nearest opening through the barrier beach was New Inlet, several miles to the south. The mckay Brazier map of 1833 indicates New Inlet was the only inlet north of Cape Hatteras. In the 1720s, Body Island was granted to Matthew Midget, who soon established a residence there. Body Island was a true island at the time, approximately nine and a half miles long and extending from Roanoke Inlet to the north to Doug Inlet to the south. The creation of the present Oregon Inlet in 1846 occurred during a violent storm on September 7th. C.O. Boutel happened to be on Body Island in connection with his work with the U.S. Coast Survey when the storm hit. On the morning of the September gale, the sign waters were all piled up to the southwest from the effects of the heavy northeast blow of the previous days. The weather was clear, nearly calm, until about 11 a.m. when a sudden squall came from the southwest and the waters came upon the beach with such a fury that Mr. Midget, within three quarters of a mile of his highest when the storm began, was unable to reach it until about four in the afternoon. He sat upon his horse on a small sand knoll for five hours and witnessed the destruction of his property and as he supposed of his family also, without the power to move a foot to their rescue, and for two hours expecting every moment to be swept to sea himself. It is said that Oregon Inlet was named for the first vessel to pass through it, the small, side-wheeled steamer Oregon, owned by William H. Willard. Oregon Inlet remained a relatively minor artery of trade and transportation in the 1850s. Hatteras Inlet to the south, which had been opened by the same storm, was used much more frequently. With all its limitations, it provided a convenient and direct link between the Atlantic Ocean and the widely scattered trading centers of the Albemarle region. In November of 1871, work was begun on the present Body Island Lighthouse. Already it was clear that the inlet was migrating to the south so the new lighthouse would be built on the north side of the inlet. Soon after the lighthouse was constructed, it was proposed that Oregon Inlet be improved to provide a more dependable and safe passage to vessels engaged in the coastal trades. But the inlet and its interior channels were found to be unstable and treacherous. Moreover, it was clear that the problems of improving the inlet would be compounded by its continual movement to the south. Also in the 1870s, two life-saving stations were established in the vicinity of Oregon Inlet by the United States Life-Saving Service. The first was built on the south side of the inlet and called Body Island Station. In 1878, the second station was built on the north side of Oregon Inlet and was called Tommy's Hummock. Later, however, the original station was renamed Oregon Inlet Station and the second assumed the name Body Island Station. In 1882, 
Oregon Inlet and the Old House Channel were again examined with the view of improving navigation for vessels engaged in coastal trades. Contrary to earlier predictions, the inlet had actually broadened and deepened during the previous decade, but its persistent migration southward and its changeable nature were still seen as impediments to its lasting improvement. From 1849 to 1909, the inlet moved nearly a mile southward. Still, the inlet widened and deepened on its own. However, the depth was subject to rapid fluctuations. For many years following the 1882 survey, little or no consideration would be given by the federal government to attempting lasting improvements at Oregon Inlet. In 1927, a study was done to determine the feasibility of providing a channel six feet deep and 150 feet wide from Manteo southward through Roanoke Sound to the main channel in Pamlico Sound. It was determined, however, that the desired improvement was an impractical one and the project was not undertaken. During the years following World War II, it was proposed that the channels through Oregon Inlet between the inlet and Manteo be deepened further. In addition, it was requested that a channel be cut to the mouth of Mill Creek near Wanchis. It was estimated that three quarters of Dare County was commercially dependent on Oregon Inlet and its connecting channels. The project was authorized by Congress in 1950 and called for a 14-foot deep and 400-foot wide channel through the inlet, with connecting channels 12 feet deep and 100 feet wide southwestward to Pamlico Sound and northward to Wanchis and Manteo. The concept of a, uh, a system of channels from Oregon Inlet through, through Oregon Inlet into Manteo into one cheese on the deep water in Pamlico Sound um, was the concept. Um, it did a lot of things. It united the area, uh, both uh, economically and and I think um, in other ways as well. And it did give us access to the to the fish. To ensure stability of the inlet channel, it was thought that lengthy rubble stone jetties might eventually be needed. After careful consideration of options, the Army Corps of Engineers determined that the proposed jetties would not be necessary and the desired improvements at Oregon Inlet could be achieved and maintained through dredging alone. Before the deepening of Oregon Inlet and Allied Channels in the spring of 1958, the entire commercial fleet consisted of about 35 small boats, averaging less than 40 feet in length and having an average draft of less than four feet. These were mostly sport fishing vessels that were converted to commercial use during the off-season each year. Following the deepening of Oregon Inlet, the commercial fleet grew in numbers, length, and draft each year. Local fishermen with many years' experience fishing the sounds adjacent to Oregon Inlet, often at a loss, purchased larger boats with greater potential for profitable offshore operations. The fishery was also expanded to include new species such as scallops, deep sea lobsters, and swordfish, in addition to the traditional species such as flounder, croaker, sea mullet, and trout. The number one thing that affected it was the people's ability to make an income. And, and the more access they were given to get to those fish, the more income that it brought in. And, and uh, I mean, the, the average size boat uh, it was 50 to 55 foot, and, and the size of the vessels got bigger, uh, the, the production got bigger, and uh, it just, you know, it was a real boom or boost to the economy here in Wanchies. In addition, harbor operations at Wanchies, Stumpy Point, and Inglehart began attracting ocean going trawlers from other North Carolina ports and from locations as far north as Canada and Maine and as far south as Florida. In 1958, before the deepening of Oregon Inlet, seafood landings were less than 1.5 million pounds. In 1962, just four years later, due to a deepened yet unstable Oregon Inlet, production exceeded 10 million pounds. The fleet also grew to over 60 offshore vessels, 
ranging from 50 to 100 feet and from 6 to 9 feet in draft. Fishing fleets from other area ports numbered as many as 147. In addition, there were about 111 vessels operating from ports in New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. 30 to 40 Canadian longline vessels were also operating in the area off Oregon Inlet. As the market expanded, the inlet became more and more difficult to navigate safely. Valuable fishing time was often lost when offshore conditions were favorable. Even as the offshore fishery continued to develop, lives and ships were being lost in and around the inlet at an alarming rate. Specified dimensions for the project authorized by Congress in 1950 were finally achieved a decade later through extensive use of a variety of dredges. Even with prolonged dredging and much difficulty, the specified dimensions were only achieved and maintained sporadically. Despite the continual dredging of Oregon Inlet in the 1950s and 1960s, fishing boats were finding passage through the inlet extremely difficult and hazardous. As the vessels got larger, more power, they, they, they drew more water. And then we began to lose boats. We began to lose people. We lost fishing vessel after fishing vessel as Oregon Inlet shoaled. The state-operated ferry was also finding it difficult to make its daily runs across the inlet. A bridge across the inlet was already being proposed so the ferry could be taken out of operation. I was raised here in Dare County. I've lived here all my life. In fact, my dad uh, was one of the ferry boat captains for the state of North Carolina. And he actually, one of his jobs was ferry boat captain across Oregon Inlet. And he ran that ferry for a number of years uh, across the inlet and actually ran it there and watched the bridge being built. In August of 1961, a bill was introduced in Congress by Congressman Herbert C. Bonner calling for construction of the bridge. The bridge was completed in 1963 and named for Congressman Bonner. When they built the bridge across the Oregon Inlet, we, uh, you know, the inlet was, was pretty big and there's a reason the bridge is so long. But o over the years, uh, I have been able to see how, um, although the bridge was a great thing, it's kind of, I think it's helped to fill the inlet in. It's kind of worked as a, uh, a sand fence and you know, so the inlet has closed up tremendously, uh, especially around the bridge area, and it's gone from you know a mile or two wide to a quarter or that or less now. Difficulties in navigating through the hazardous Oregon Inlet Channel have persisted until the present. The future safety of the inlet is in doubt. The inlet has been closed innumerable times since 1982 due to storms and continual southward migration of the Body Island Spit, requiring emergency dredging to reopen the channel. Basically, when you leave the dock and come in, it's different than it was in the few days we're going. You know, you have to basically get a report for what to do when you come in versus what you did going out. The winter starts getting us really bad, you know shallowing up and all that, switching the ways we go, just having to run by our plotters, not the buoys. Never a dull moment in that place, that's for sure. With continuing failure to stabilize Oregon Inlet through dredging alone, Congressman Walter B. Jones in 1968 supported a jetty project and other measures to improve navigation through the inlet and its connecting channels. Governor Robert Scott also supported the jetties and the deepening of the channel across the ocean bar. As we began to continue to lose boats, and we lost people. We lost a lot of people in Oregon Inlet, uh, being trapped offshore, not being able to get in through the inlet in the storm. And so the effort then began to try to find a way to stabilize that inlet. And that began the efforts to try to develop Oregon Inlet. In 1970, Congress authorized a major modification of the existing Shalabag Bay project, calling for construction of rubble stone jetties and the deepening of the bar channel to 20 feet. 
Due to the difficulties encountered in the design phase of the project, little or nothing was done for more than a decade to bring the jetty project to completion. In August of 1981, the United States Department of the Interior decided to oppose the project. The Army Corps of Engineers was asked to examine alternate methods of securing a safe and navigable channel without jetties. The need for improved navigation through Oregon Inlet became critical in the early 1980s because of the development of the Juan Chis Marine Industrial Park. The federal government, the government basically said, if we're going to build jetties at Oregon Inlet, then North Carolina, you have to have some skin in the game. We want you to have, uh, be a partner in the project and have some investment in it also. So the park is basically that component of the project or the requirement that was put on the state of North Carolina as part of the effort to build jetties at, at Oregon Inlet. By March of 1982, there were reports of fishermen abandoning their home ports on Roanoke Island and moving to ports where there was more access to the ocean. As the stalemate continued, the future of the Wanchis Marine Industrial Park was in jeopardy. For the next three decades, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers completed numerous economic studies to determine if the stabilization project was justified and submitted plans to stabilize the inlet. It repeatedly faced opposition from the U.S. Department of the Interior and the National Marine Fisheries Service. By 2003, the stabilization project had become a $108 million proposal to build the jetties. After three decades of economic development and investment in the area based on congressional promises, the White House Council on Environmental Quality killed the plan to keep the inlet open with jetties. The decision, released in May 2003, included assurances that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would receive enough funding to keep the inlet dredged to maintain the authorized 14-foot depth. Since 1994, the Army Corps of Engineers has only been able to maintain the 14-foot depth of the channel 15% of the time. The limited dredging resulted in the U.S. Coast Guard's inability to properly position navigation buoys for the channel. You have to remember in 1970, the plan was to build a really a hub for the commercial fishing industry for the entire eastern seaboard of the United States. So the plan was to build a, a man-made harbor that was bulkheaded and, and in a protected area. Uh, also to put a water system in at the facility and a sewer system in that could handle seafood processing. You know, they really thought that we'd not only be unloading fish here, but we'd be doing value-added uh, things to the seafood, packaging it and processing it and canning it or doing whatever right here on site, and then everything would just go out by truck. And that was the original plan. The problem with that is that while this component of the project was built, the jetties never worked. So we never got a sustainable, uh, safe, uh, uh, dependable inlet like we were told by the federal government we were going to get. So we, when you didn't have that, then it was uh, large seafood corporations, companies or whatever were hesitant to make an investment in, in processing facilities or, what, or fish houses or whatever here, uh, not knowing whether the inlet was ever going to be reliable or dependable. In 2006, a study of the economic benefits of Oregon Inlet, commissioned by the Dare County Board of Commissioners, was released. It outlined the multi-million dollar impact of Oregon Inlet on Dare County and the surrounding region, including monetary benefits from the commercial fishing industry, seafood packing and processing, boat building and support services, and recreational fishing and tourism sectors. A study by Moffitt and Nickel in May 2014 looked at the five main economic sectors tied to Oregon Inlet. Those sectors are commercial fishing, seafood packing and processing, boat building and support services, recreational fishing and tourism, and tournament fishing. Those five sectors in 2014 provided a total annual economic impact of 4,348 jobs and $548.4 million to the state of North Carolina. Dare County has had a long history of boat building. I mean, 
from back in the 1800s where the shad boats were developed here and built here and you know fishermen uh, you couldn't go out and get a boat so they built their own and uh, and and kind of got into the same thing for the char guys they they wanted boats to fish offshore and stuff so they started building boats and they they were very good at it and we had some real pioneers in the boat building industry here uh, you know and those guys uh, kind of set a precedent and now uh, this area is recognized as one of the premier boat building areas uh, in our country really all up and down the East Coast we are uh, recognized at a sort of a mecca for uh, custom sport fish boats and some of the some of the best boats uh, that go all over the world come out of this county now according to the study those five main study sectors could potentially provide undercurrent economic conditions, a total annual economic impact of 5,397 jobs and $693 million to the state of North Carolina if the inlet were fully open. With the closest harbor to the north being Norfolk and the closest harbor to the south being Moorhead City, boats that wish to safe harbor or offload their catch are faced with difficult decisions while fishing off Oregon Inlet should the inlet prove to be impassable. Norfolk is 90 miles to the north and Moorhead City is 120 miles to the south. A boat that is forced to go to Norfolk to offload its catch has economic impacts on Dare County and the state of North Carolina. If the inlet closes, those five study sectors would suffer serious economic repercussions. Oregon Inlet, as well as its offshore waters, have always been dangerous. The changing weather, currents, and shifting shoals create an exemplary challenge to even the most seasoned boat captain. The U.S. Coast Guard has over the years tried to maintain navigational buoys and bulletins to mariners to try to make the inlet more navigable. But the inlet changes so much that attempts to alert boaters have not been able to keep up. Since the 1960s, over 21 people have lost their lives and 26 boats have been lost in and around the inlet. The inlet has become so perilous that the U.S. Coast Guard has had to close it to navigation several times. Ebb tide on a heavy northeast wind or any kind of swells, any sea on the bar, just makes it, makes it uh, sketchy, really sketchy. Uh, just. If it's impassable, I mean, as far as going through there, you can charge through there, or try to, and then you get caught wrong. It's a, chance, you know, it's a game changer. It'll ruin you just as quick as you can snap your fingers. And uh, many, many times go through there. I say, I can't believe we did that. I can't believe this didn't break and that break, but then get by with it for a long time, and then all of a sudden, just like I said, you know, just well, don't take for one. And, change your whole life. The new Bonner Bridge replacement will have wider spans which will provide safer passage under the bridge through Oregon Inlet. The Dare County Board of Commissioners established an inlet maintenance fund in 2016. Starting in fiscal year 2016, the Dare County Board of Commissioners approved three million dollars each year for dredging Oregon Inlet. This money is matched by the state of North Carolina. Dare County pays one-third of the cost. The state contributes two-thirds of the cost. Dare County also budgets $250,000 for dredging Hatteras Inlet. This project is matched by the state as well. Dare County puts in one-quarter of the cost and the state picks up three-quarters. The ongoing proactive dredging that was started in October 2015 has had an impact. The goal is to establish and maintain a 400 foot wide and 14 foot deep channel from the Bonner Bridge through the bar to deep water. As of September 30th, 2016, the channel depth was a minimum of nine feet. The project remains reactive. While this is good news for the charter fleet, small commercial craft and recreational boaters, the channel is not yet at a dependable depth to provide safe passage for large commercial vessels. Even as navigation has improved in modern times, 
the inlet has remained among the most dangerous passages for any boat anywhere on the East Coast. So the inlet remains. If left alone, it will continue to move and change. Storms will come and go and continue to have their effect on the channel. The questions remain of how to make such a vital part of Dare County's economy safe and predictable to navigate. To not solve that problem could cost the county hundreds of millions of dollars in economic impact and thousands of jobs.